Hello, welcome to the official lesson one in the course R for Publication. Today we'll be talking about how to do some basic things in R and R Studio. I want to start by going over some goals for today's lesson. We'll be making an R project. We'll also be committing to Git and then pushing up to Bitbucket. We'll get some practice reading in and manipulating data, as well as making a figure and saving it to a PDF. And finally, we're going to create an R Markdown document to summarize all the work we did today. Before we get started, I want to go over some very basic things here first. The data we'll be working with today looks something like this. What you see here is two snapshots of the data, the first and final five rows. We call this whole data set a data frame. Within a data frame, the columns are generally referred to as variables. So here, for example, group is a variable that describes data points in this data frame. And the variable group can be broken down into levels. In this case, the groups are monolingual and bilingual. This is the main variable we're working with today. To get started with the lesson, pause the video and follow the instructions below. When you're told to come back to the video again, click play to learn more about some of the code in the lesson. Before going into details of the code we just wrote, I want to emphasize that there are a lot of ways to do the same thing in R. One of the things that's great about R is that it's open source language which means anyone can make new packages and new ways to do things. That also means there's not only one way to do something, which can sometimes lead to confusion. Take, for example, the code we just wrote, creating a data frame with just the bilingual data. We had a data frame called data, a variable called group, which had two levels, monolingual and bilingual. We wanted to create a new data frame with just the bilingual data. We could have done it like this, or like this, or like this. In this course, we'll be focusing on the final method, the dplyr method. If you've used one of these other methods in the past, that does not mean they are incorrect. We're just using a different method for this course. If you've never seen these other methods before, don't worry about them, we won't be using them. Okay, let's dissect our code a little more now. I've written dplyr at the top left-hand corner here as a reminder that we're using the dplyr package for this code. Anytime you see something written in the top left-hand corner in bold like this, it will refer to a package we're using. So the first thing we're going to do is name our new data frame, in this case, data BL. Then we're going to start by setting it equal to our old data frame, data. The next piece of code is probably the strangest to you. It's called the pipe. It's a way within dplyr to tell R that we're not done coding yet. As long as a line of code ends in a pipe, R will continue to look down to the next line of code to see what to do. In this way, we can create layers and pass a data frame down from one line of code to the next. That second line of code begins with our verb, in this case, filter. Filter is a verb that lets you select a particular subset of your data. In this course, we'll be going over several of the verbs within dplyr. We then set the variable we're going to filter by, in this case, group. Then we say how to filter group. We want only data points where a group is equal to the level bilingual. Now there's a couple more things I want to point out about this code. You may have noticed that we use the equal sign at two points. In the first case, we're assigning a new data frame in our environment called data BL from our old data frame data. If you've programmed an R before, you may have also used the less than dash symbol. This is perfectly fine way, way as well. I simply prefer the single equal sign because it's one fewer character to type. The second time we use the equal sign is a marker of relationship. We're saying that the value for group must be equal to bilingual. This is similar to using less than or greater than sign if group were a continuous variable. Okay, so at the beginning, our data frame had 400 rows and three columns. Now, after our filter call, we have 200 rows and three columns because we've dropped all the monolingual data or half the data points. What if we wanted to further filter our data by another call though? For example, what if we only wanted reaction times less than 1100 milliseconds? To do this, let's return to our code. To add another filter call in dplyr, we simply start by adding another pipe. Remember, the pipe tells R to keep looking for more code. In this way, we can string together several different filter calls while keeping our code clean and easy to read. Next, we'll add another filter call just like we did the first time. Again, we'll name our variable to filter by, in this case, RT. And then we'll end by adding the marker relationship and the value. 
Since RT is a continuous variable, we use the less than sign and the number 1100 to only include reaction times less than 1100. Now, if we compare it to our original data frame, we see that data BL only has 153 rows, because now we filter not only by group, but also by reaction times. The second filter call was just an exercise. If you've added it to your code, please delete it. You can pause the video and return to the lesson below to continue to the next part about making a figure. Come back when you're ready. This time, we'll go through the code for the plot you just made. Again, I made ggplot2 written in bold in the top left-hand corner as a reminder that that's the package we're using for this code. The first thing we'll do is name our plot. The use of dot plot is by no means required. I just use that as a convention. Feel free to name the plot whatever you want. Next, we're going to initialize our plot. All ggplot2 plots begin the same way, with the call ggplot. We then tell ggplot2 the data frame it should use to create the plot. In our case, this is data. We then add a call for the aesthetics of the plot, or AES. These are the basics of the plot, such as what should go on the x and y axes. We then give our x-axis variable, in our case group, and our y-axis variable, in our case RT, or reaction time. At the end of the line, we write a plus sign. This is similar to the pipe we used when writing code in dplyr. Instead of a pipe, though, it's simply a plus sign. Like in dplyr, in ggplot2, we can create layers of code to slowly build up the final product of our plot. Finally, on our second line, we specify what type of plot we're making. Pretty much all ggplot2 plot types begin with geom underscore, followed by the plot type. For example, geom bar for bar plot, geom point for scatter plot, etc. In our case, we're making a box plot, as you can see here. To actually see the plot you made, call the plot on a new line and it should appear in one of your RStudio windows. If you follow the code we wrote, the plot you made should look something like this. There's a lot of ways to further customize how plots look in ggplot2 by adding more layers. So instead of plots like this, my final plots tend to look more like this. I won't go over in this lesson how to do this, but the code is available in the scripts online. Most aspects of the code are commented, but there are some parts you may need to learn to look up to learn more about. I've also included in the script a few more examples of dplyr verbs. Feel free to play around with them now, or wait until we use them during a lesson. If you'd like to learn more about dplyr now, I highly recommend Hadley Wickham's 2014 user tutorial. The link can be found at the end of the lesson. I hope you enjoyed your non-standard R introduction. See you next time!